<clears throat> we're going to talk about shared memory and using shared memory and where it applies in, uh, in avionics test and simulation type of applications. But before we get there, the first thing we have to do is talk about, you know, kind of the general architecture and needs and requirements of, of large, you know, a avionics simulations. And the first place we have to do to start that, or the first place we have to start there, is with the discussion of hardware in the loop strategies. So hardware in the loop is a, a test and simulation strategy that's used in, uh, in aerospace and avionics, also used in automotive testing and simulation and development. Uh, and also power systems. And these are just three. There's lots of other places uh, also where that, that test strategy can be used and employed. The basic idea of, of a hardware in the loop strategy or concept is that um, you think of an avionics or an automotive system as an example. Uh, you usually have some kind of a dynamic system, say an engine on an aircraft or an, an automotive engine. And then uh, typically in, in you know these modern vehicles or modern systems, you have an embedded control system. So some kind of embedded computer or system of distributed embedded computers which are taking and reading input and data from sensors um, on the dynamic system. For instance, the engine, uh, measuring temperature, vibration, these sorts of things. Uh, that embedded uh, controller is then computing uh, this data, uh, this dynamic data, and then controlling that system and optimizing it so that it operates uh, optimally. And so the idea of hardware in the loop is to use mathematical models running in real-time processors to simulate that dynamic system and you know the dynamic data that would be going into the embedded control system in a real-time processor so that you can test integrate and develop that real-time system that real-time software and firmware without having an expensive aircraft aircraft engine or automotive engine there and without having the burden of, of that you would have to say cycle an engine over certain temperature cycles when you could just in a uh, you know simulated mathematical models simulate um, you know a range of say a, a temperature cycle uh, at a sensor. So that's hardware in the loop. If we look at an aircraft system, an, an example of using hardware in the loop in aircraft, a, a good um, kind of easy to assess example is think of a cockpit flight simulator. So in this case we would have a, a real cockpit with real avionics displays, real controls, uh, basically a mock-up of a cockpit inside a building somewhere. What we wouldn't have available or present at that time is the rest of the aircraft, the engine systems, the hydraulic systems, the power dis distribution systems, all these other dynamic systems that are controlled and monitored from the cockpit during flight operations. So we would want to simulate those uh, with a, a real-time processor uh, running math models that simulate the dynamics of these different systems. And in the, in the case of an aircraft, it may be several real-time processors because um, you know, when we, when we talk about an aircraft, as I'm showing here, um, it's typical for there to be 70 to 100,000 different parameters that the, the embedded control systems of the, of the aircraft have to interact with, operate on, and, and, and work with. So we're talking about you know, up to 100,000 different aircraft parameters. And also when we talk about the digital I.O. lines and the analog and discrete lines that are used to communicate this data between the sensors, actuators, and the embedded control systems, um, we're talking on the order of thousands of, of digital an and analog channels. So hundreds and hundreds of ARINC 429 channels, um, ARINC 664 Ethernet channels, CAN bus even, even MIL standard 1553. So we have a very large number of I.O. and a very large number of dynamic aircraft parameters that have to be computed and simulated uh, in, the, in the hardware in the loop system. So looking a little bit deeper at the example of a avionics uh, simulation system, uh, basically a, a flight simulator. Like I said a, a couple slides back, we're talking about in the range of 100,000 uh, different dynamic parameters that have to be computed and, and simulated, and we're also talking about thousands of I.O. lines. So in a real application, typically um, like this, the whole simulation and the whole system cannot consist of a simple, um, you know, 19-inch rack mount PXI chassis with a real-time embedded controller and I.O. modules. More than one real-time processors is almost always needed and in addition to that the, the volume and the, the sheer number of I.O. interfaces is so large that um, that it's it's also required to have the, the simulation span multiple chassis just for space for all the I.O. modules. Uh, what I also have here in the picture is typically you have the, the one or more real-time uh, processors running the math models and they're usually connected on a LAN to one or more 
Um, basically think of it as desktop PCs that is the user interface. So it's basically the graphical interface running in a non-real-time operating system, like say Windows. Uh, and that's where the user would interact with um, you know, the, the user configurable parts of the simulation model. Okay, so if we have to have actually multiple chassis and have a distributed, you know, real-time simulation system, there's additional considerations. So now we can't just rely on the PXI uh, backplane timing and synchronization signals. Um, we also need a way to synchronize across multiple chassis or multiple systems and multiple real-time processors. So again, with PXI, there's, you know, readily available, there's, there's PXI modules that can be used to extend and link together the PXI timing and synchronization signals between chassis. So we're talking about a single slot timing and synchronization module in each chassis that can then be connected, um, you know, wired, daisy chained together to distribute uh, the clock and to share it across multiple chassis and multiple systems. So um, with these off-the-shelf uh, modules that are available, we can do inter, inter chassis sharing of the uh, PXI uh, clock signal also the PXI star and the PXI backplane triggers. So that handles the clock, the timing, and the synchronization. But what about data? So what, how do we share the data? We're, think, we're talking 70,000 parameters here that you know, for each cycle of the simulation thread, we have to calculate. We have to read some of these, update them, calculate them, and write them back out so that they can go through the I.O. modules into the system under test. So how, how can we share the data between the distributed mod modules? And that's where the shared memory comes in. Um, so, the the concept of shared and reflective memory. Uh, the picture here shows, you know, kind of the the general idea of, of what it is. So, the idea is, you know, you'd have multiple um, computers connected through some kind of a network, um, but they're actually sharing um, basically a virtual bank of memory. So, if one PC or system would write to a certain address in that shared memory. Any of the other, any of the other PCs connected would um, essentially instantaneously be able to set data because it would be, you know, virtually a shared piece of, of RAM. So how is this actually implemented with uh, with the solution that we are able to provide at AIT? So it's implemented using a, a fiber optic ring network or a loop network. So it's an optical network. Um, the nodes on the network are con uh, connected in a loop, so all the data passes through the nodes on the on its way um, across the network and then it's forwarded on to the next node. Um, the implementation that we support is a 2.125 uh, gigabit per second network, so a very high speed gigabit speed network. And it's also very simple. Um, it allows a maximum of 256 nodes, so it's a very simple one byte node address or node ID that's contained in the messages that cycle on the network uh, or on the loop. And <clears throat> there's, it's ultra low overhead. Uh, the idea is to use as much of that 2 gigabit per second uh, bit rate that's available on the network to actually share the data that would go into the memory uh, as a, and avoid having a lot of protocol overhead. So it's a very simple frame structure. Uh, basically an 8-bit node ID uh, is in there. A start index, so an index into the, the, the shared memory bank. So the, the size of the shared memory bank is 256 megabytes. So when a frame is exchanged on the network, uh, you want to know which node it came from, and you want to know which, you know, the offset into that shared 256 megabytes of memory where that that data word or words that are contained in the frame are, are supposed to be uh, to occupy. It's also very easy to implement. Um, off the shelf PCI, PCI Express, PXI modules are available, um, and it's it's as easy as basically connecting them into the loop, setting a unique node ID for the module and then from the application or the simulation program just reading and writing to the shared bank of memory in the local system uh, then our network and our cards take care of uh, distributing that data to the other cards so uh, on the network so that they show up uh, at the application interface in the distributed modules with ultra low latency uh, taking a, a little bit more of a look at what uh, what's available out there for hardware that actually supports this shared memory network so at AIT, we're able to provide PXI Express, PCI Express, PCI, and also Mezzanine XMC modules um, that, that implement the shared memory uh, local system interface. For all these modules, um, Windows and Linux, so non-real-time drivers are available, in addition to drivers for real-time systems like LabVIEW, QNX, and VXWorks. So um, lots of options. 
Uh, very easy to pick a, a common form factor and from a, a set of common operating systems and to be ready to go up and using the module with little or no integration. The APIs for these modules, obviously it's, it's simple to memory, are very simple. Uh, basically a matter of configuring the node ID for the module and then reading and writing to the, the memory locations. Again, with the modules you can connect them directly in a loop and uh, basically the network's ready to go. In addition to an actual wired loop type of uh, wiring topology, uh, the shared memory network is also able to utilize a hub, a shared memory network hub, and this can be used to simplify wiring. So simply each node uh, on the shared memory network can just be wired to the hub. The hub operates the network as a loop, so what it does is takes in a, a receive signal from a port and then it forwards it on and transmits it out the next port and so on and so forth. So even though it's wired as a star and into a hub or something that looks like a switch, it's still the network is actually operated like a loop. Uh, the nice part of what using something like a hub can provide in addition to simplified wiring is a bypass mode. So if you think about a hardwired loop, if any of the modules on the loop would malfunction or have some kind of a power issue, the loop would be broken, broken and essentially the whole network would not work. With a hub, with a bypass mode available, if you have a malfunctioning module in the loop, the hub is able to sense that it's not transmitting, uh, actively transmitting data anymore, and it would then be able to switch into a mode where it bypasses that port or that module. So the hub can detect when there's a failure in the loop, take that malfunctioning module out of the loop, and basically heal the loop and allow the rest of it to keep operating normally. Um, the other thing that this, this bypass mode allows is hot plug and play type of operations. So you can think of maybe a simulation where you want to take you know, a real-time processor in and out of the loop as, as capacity, processing capacity is required. And with the hub, you can do this without physically having to wire around that uh, node in the loop. Okay, in addition to supporting the sharing of memory uh, with all the, all the nodes on the network, um, the shared reflective memory network also supports um, the ability to share events. So what this means is, is a, a specific node on the network can assert an event, then all of the other nodes on the network that would subscribe or basically link to um, that event would receive that event when the source node um, asserts it. And what this looks like at the application layer is that if you think of a PCI Express card in, in one of these nodes on the network, when it would receive that event that it is subscribed to, it would cause it to generate an interrupt back to the host application in the, the, the real-time processor. So um, the, the way these events are, are typically used, or if you think of a typical um, simulation, is a master node, so a node that is, is computing and writing the data that it's sharing with other nodes on the network, will do that, he'll do his computations, share the data, so write it into the shared memory, which will then get reflected to the local memory and all the, the systems on the node. Uh, that master node would then assert a network event to signal to the other nodes that it has just updated um, its data, so its range of bytes in the shared memory bank. And then the consumer nodes or the receivers would receive that event, which would signal to them that now fresh data is available to read at whatever offset into the, the, the memory there. Like I said at the beginning, large avionics simulations can easily require large amounts of computing resources and I.O. resources. So multiple real-time processors can be required to compute, you know, in the range of 100,000 dynamic parameters, and up to thousands of I.O. channels can be required. As a result of this, um, it's often that these avionics simulations require multiple chassis or, or a distributed approach to the test system. And if that's the case, um, where the computing and the I.O. resources interfaces are spread across multiple systems, then typically you're going to have a need to share the timing and synchronization signals and also share the data parameters. And so a shared memory network um, could be implemented with the modules that AIT can provide to allow the sharing of these data parameters and also some synchronization with the distribution and sharing of events.